We're talking today with Tony Van Portfleet of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, now, Tony, give us some background on yourself. Uh, to begin with, where and when were you born? Well, uh, born right down the road here, about a mile away, and uh, August 15, 1923. Okay. In an old shack alongside the road. All right, and for outside audience, I mean, uh, where are we right now? Are we officially in Grand Rapids or out in Kent well, County or Ottawa? Grand Rapids mailing address, but it's yeah. Marne. Yeah. yeah. So we're in Ottawa County, Michigan, so we're kind of north and west of Grand Rapids. All yeah. right. Now, did you grow up in this area? Yeah, I've been within a couple of miles of this place my whole life, except okay. during the Army, three years. But other okay. than that, I've been, always been right here in this neighborhood. All right. In and fact, I was in this house 52 years. Okay. Now, what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? You mean myself? Your, your, your family, your parents, what did well, they do? My dad uh, worked at the city of Grand Rapids in the um, highway department. And then after I got old enough to start working, which was about 14, well, we was, uh, worked on cars because I was always interested in cars. And then finally I kept on going, got jobs, and then I went to the Army. Okay. Now, uh, your father, did he have steady work during the 1930s, or was it on and off? My dad? Yeah. Steady. Okay. Yeah, but it was during the Depression, and he didn't bring $3 a week home. Mm -hmm. That didn't go very far. Of course, it bought more than today, three bucks. Okay. But, uh, and how far did you go in school? Eighth grade. Okay. And so you finished eighth grade, you could go out and get a job. Well, the, yeah, and the, the war was all over the world, so the outlook wasn't too good. So I says, I'll just wait this out. Well, I waited too long, and they drafted me just about. All right. From school to, to the Army, let's put it that way. Okay. Well, you had school, and you were working, because you would have been working for a while before Pearl Harbor. Yeah, I yeah. was. Right. Not uh, long, a couple Do you years remember years. how you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, I was riding in the car on the way to South Haven one day on Sunday afternoon, and uh, we heard on the radio. All right. Uh, two in the afternoon, something like that. Okay. And before that happened, um, were you paying much attention to what was going on in the world? A little, yeah. Because uh, at my age, I kind of feared I was going to get in, uh, especially the last year of my in school, uh, in the eighth grade, uh, some of us older kids was talking to the teacher and he kept close tab on the world news mm -hmm. and uh, one of the kids, Dean Fredrickson, mentioned, uh, uh, looks like we'll be in on it. And the teacher said, yes, you're just right to be in on it. Well, that was my age too. Okay. <laughs> now, what, what year did you finish school? Well, that I don't, I wonder. <laughs> like 1936 or 7 or? Yeah, it must have been 36 or 37, somewhere yeah. in there. So by then, the Nazis were taking over Germany, yeah. and there, but there wasn't a big war going on yet. No. They were just doing they can scary stuff. Taking country, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, now, there was already a draft that started uh, as early as 1940, 41, before Pearl Harbor. Uh, and did you decide just to, to wait your turn? They had my brother in for a year, which of course he didn't get to finish that year before the war started. Mm -hmm. And I figured I was coming next, so I just kind of, well, you couldn't get a good job anyway. Right. There wasn't any. We were just pulling out the depression and living from kind of like hand to mouth. Yeah. Well, there were defense industry jobs. Oh, yeah. And if you had one of those, you might stay out of the Army. Uh, you but... couldn't get one of them, or I couldn't anyway. Okay. All right. So when did you get your draft notice? It must have been the last part of 42, okay. because I went in January 43. All right. Now, when you went in, um, where did they send you for basic training? Camp Gordon, Georgia. Okay. How did they get you down there? Train. Okay. And do you remember how long that took? Well, I, I'm sure we were on the train overnight, a couple of days in, in a night. It's mm -hmm. only 850, 900 miles. Okay. So. It just depends on how many times you have to stop. And yeah, we went through, uh, you know, mountains of Virginia and places like that. It was interesting to see. Okay. Uh, now, um, now, where in Georgia was that camp? Do you know? Right by Augusta, okay. just outside of Augusta. Okay. Uh, and what did they have you do once you got there? Well, we've had all kinds of marching and uh, 
classes on different guns. Uh, I remember I had I was on a 37 millimeter and a tank gun for a while. I wasn't too fond of that because it didn't look good at all. And then uh, somehow or other, I they done away with that gun in the artillery outfit, and we had 105s. But I spent an awful lot of time taking machine guns apart, and putting them together, <laughs> hundreds of times. All right. Now, when you were growing up, uh, did you do hunting and that kind of thing? Hunting? Were you a hunter when you were a kid? I had gone hunting only once, okay. uh, deer hunting, and I got a deer the first half hour, and that was good enough. <laughs> okay. So you had didn't have a lot of experience with guns before no, you got no, in there? No, no, no. That was the only time I ever pulled a trigger. Okay. Then I did it wrong, but somehow or other, I hit the deer. He's right in front of me. Well, there you go. Okay. So you start working with machine guns. Now, does that lead to a different assignment then? Well, I was a truck driver and a command car driver, too. But uh, I think mainly my, my machine guns was, was about it. Okay. Now, when you're in training, uh, were you training specifically to go into artillery, or did you not know yet? I. I got, as soon as we got to Georgia, uh, Camp Gordon there, I found out I was an artillery outfit. Okay. And were you training with the same unit you would go overseas with? I was a lucky guy, one of the luckiest in the world. Uh, I was in, there was a bunch of rough characters in there, a lot of from Detroit and some places in New York. Uh, fortunately, my older brother, who had been in the Panama Canal for a year and a half, and he was brought back to the United States to regroup and retrain. Mm -hmm. And he kind of took pity on me being over where I was, and he requested through the proper channels in the outfit, requested my transfer over from this outfit over to his outfit. Okay. And that was a different world altogether. These were people that were just like you and I. We, even the colonel would shake hands with you and stuff, and uh, joke with you and talk with you. And boy, it felt like being home almost, you know. Okay. So I was lucky I got in that outfit. Okay. Now what was that outfit? What? That was called the 207th Field Artillery. Okay. The one I was in in Georgia was a 257th. Okay. Now I'm in a 207th. All right. And, and where was the 207th uh, training? Fort Ord, California. You couldn't beat that place in the world, I'll tell you. <laughs> I still wish I was there. All right. What did you like about Fort Ord? Oh, geez. The mountains, the ocean, the people, uh, you know, that I was in the Army with. And, okay. Uh, now, how much time did you spend in Georgia? Nine months. Okay. So that's a, that's a long time. All right. And in that unit, now, did you, uh, so you were, you said you were dri serving as a driver for an officer? I would, yeah, I drove officers around and that's, uh, and when we go on maneuvers, I was a driver of a command car and sometimes a weapons carrier. Okay. But then I had other jobs as soon as we got to our destination. Okay. And then what other jobs would you do when you got there? Well, oh, geez, there was <laughs> always something. <laughs> so, for a private, there was work to do 24 hours a day if you could stay awake that long. But was that like setting up camp and digging oh, yeah. or helping gun crews? There was or? numerous things all the time, yeah. Okay. Now, in addition to setting up our machine guns and tearing them down again, and oh, geez, I don't know, there's just ain't no end to it. Okay. Yeah. Well, so this was a 105 howitzer unit that you were yeah, with? Yeah, and they were just getting ready when I left, getting ready to transfer over to the 8 inch howitzer with a full track prime mover link. We also got out in Fort Ord. Okay. All right. Uh, now, while you were still in Georgia, um, did you go off base much? And well, not as much as I'd like to have, but we did get off and go into town. And of course, there was ten thousand soldiers there every Saturday night, and uh, standing room only, and then get back to camp. <laughs> okay. Well, in, in town, did they have any entertainment for the soldiers? Were there dances sure and there things was like a, that? A number of things, yeah. Okay. And what did you do when you went into town? Walked around and enjoyed the beautiful scenery and wished to him I was home. Okay. And, uh, then stand in some kind of line to get a hamburger and stand in line to get on a bus to go back home, back to camp. <laughs> uh, so, so you weren't hanging around in bars a lot or anything? Like I never that. drank a drop in my life. Well, not until the, well, I did a, after the war. I had a snort. Uh, okay. 
that was no good. So, so, so you you stayed out of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I got in trouble, but I, you know, didn't try. <laughs> All right. Uh, now you were talking a little bit about the guys in the unit in, in, in Georgia. Uh, I don't know. Were, were there fights and things like that, or there was some of that, and but there was a lot of drunks too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, you just weren't very comfortable with them. That's right. Okay. Yeah. You if you didn't drink or smoke, you were an uh, oddball, and mm -hmm. so I was an oddball. Okay. Uh, so now when you switch over and you go to uh, Fort Ord, uh, is that another train ride? Uh, that was uh, about four or five days and four or five nights. Four mm -hmm. nights. Okay. Now, did you have um, sleeping cars or did you just sit in the okay. seats? Okay. I had a uh, government reserve Pullman. So the first two nights I did not get a Pullman. I laid on the floor of an old pile of junk that I don't know how in the world they retrieved it and got it on the tracks, but I laid on the floor of that thing the best I could and I told that con what do you call conductor Porter, was the Porter. next night. I, said, I better have a Pullman tonight, buddy. Uh, well, whether he paid any attention to me or not, I don't know, but I did have a Pullman the next two nights. Okay. So that got a little better. All yeah, right. was it ever. <laughs> All right. I pretty, felt pretty crummy laying on that cold old floor, <laughs> dust and dirt and cinders blowing through that yeah. cold, going up through Cheyenne. Uh, now, now was, was this, uh, did you have a steam engine pulling the train? Yeah. So coal burning? Yeah, they put a big one on in the mountains there and then we had to go up. I can remember that uh, in the elevation a long ways. All right. You could hear the th over North Platte. That's what it was, by the way. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, you get out. I guess, how, how do they feed you on the train? Yeah, that, I, they had a, on that, that wasn't a troop train. Mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, tickets for meals. Okay. And uh, being a kid and new to all this, I missed out on some meals. This was government paid for, so mm -hmm. I had tickets left over that I just had to turn back in. But mm -hmm. I, I could have been eating pretty good if I'd have known anything. Okay. So they had a dining car on the train? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. God. And they had black porters there waiting on you, hand and foot. And I didn't know this until afterwards. It was too late then, of course. Right. Okay. Now, you get to Fort Ord. Uh, now, were most of the men in your battalion now in the 207th, had they been there a while? At Fort Ord? Yeah. They must have just got there about two or three months before because they'd been in the Panama for a year and a half. Right. But I'm asking about the personnel. Uh, did they have a lot of new guys coming in like Yeah, you? that's what they did. They weeded out some of the wrecks and old guys mm -hmm. if they were 28 years old or considered old. And uh, they got new guys in. And also they was needing, at that time, some men to work in mines. I don't know what this was all about again, but I did hear a lot about it. Uh, and those that volunteered for mine work, well, they had to be replaced with new guys like me. Okay. All right. Uh, and now, what was your brother's job in the unit? He worked in the fire direction center. And uh, they would, today it's all done with computers. In fact, it's all obsolete, what we had then. But uh, they would have different instruments and plot out the distance and the height and the wind velocity and temperatures and everything else and know exactly what that shell was going to go through on its way over to its impact area. Right. Yeah, and in those days they had yeah. slide it, it took a lot. and other things. Yeah. Yeah. And he, in combat, he, had, he was on duty 24, no, 12 hours a day, mm -hmm. 12 on, 12 off, Right. seven days a week. Okay. And then how much did you see of him once you got there? How much did I see of what? Of your brother. Did well, we spend much time together? In, uh, in Fort Ord, we was together quite a bit. When we got in combat, of course, uh, we all had our own jobs to do, and I seen him occasionally. He was right. in the same outfit. Okay. Now, when did you get to Fort Ord? Uh, this had to be about in October of 40... 43? Three. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then once you were there, how long did you stay at Fort Ord? Nine months. Okay. But generally, we was up in the mountainous area uh, on training right okay. near Fort Ord. All right. Uh, and then with this battalion, uh, what's your job now? Well, there again, I was driving when we went to places. When we got to our destinations, I would 
have to set up a either a 30 or a 50 caliber machine gun and pretend I was all set to go at it. And uh, like I say, there was numerous jobs for a private or private first class, which I had then. But for us guys at the bottom, they had work for us all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what did an artillery unit need machine guns for? Yeah, that's where I was lucky again. Same job in the in infantry, you wouldn't get very old. But in me, I got to see the whole show and I didn't have to participate. I just had to have those, there was uh, eight of us machine gunners in this headquarters, mm -hmm. a two men to each machine gun. And we had to be ready in case our outfit got overrun from the enemy. Okay. Or any airplanes that come over, right. we had to peck away at them. Yeah, because the 50 caliber machine guns were also anti aircraft guns. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so you're basically there to protect the gunners that's, and the equipment and everything. That's what it was, yeah. Okay. That's where it was uh, lucky me because, uh, like I say, in the infantry, they went to work on the enemy itself. Um, okay. We was just inches from it, but uh, we didn't get involved that bad. Right. Okay, uh, so uh, and now uh, when you were off duty at Fort Ord, what would you do? Well, I'd go into Monterey as much as I could. It was difficult because uh, so did everybody else want to go there. And they only had so many buses. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you always had a big line to wait in. <laughs> you didn't get to spend much time in there. Not only that, but there were 10,000 guys in a small town. Mm -hmm. uh, Standing room only, you know. All right. It was now, fun. Okay. Now, before they shipped you overseas, uh, did you get a leave to go home? Yeah, I got. Uh, it was quite a while before I, we went overseas, and I was dang near ready for another trip home, but mm -hmm. they shipped us out first. Okay. So when did you go home? That did you go home from Fort Ord or from Georgia? Well, once I went home from Georgia. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next time I no more and got to California, and uh, it wasn't long, and I got to go home. So uh, that was uh, added expense and a lot of time involved. <laughs> okay. Because the funeral, uh, the uh, furlough is only so long. Right. And you've got to get there and get back again. Well, our commanding officer was good in this way too. He gave us a weekend pass ahead of time, and you know they tried to register you. Got to spend a little time home in a way. Right. Okay. Uh, now, during all this time when you're training, I mean, the war is going on in the Pacific and in North Africa and then uh, in Europe. Um, did you have any idea where you were going to go or when you were going to go? We had pretty much had an idea that we'd be going to Europe. Okay. And why do you think you would go to Europe rather than the Pacific? I don't know really why of that. We was on the West Coast, and they shipped us all the way to New York, and mm -hmm. uh, we just had that feeling. Yeah, but once they ship you to New York, they, they, they gave it away. But Well, they didn't uh, tell us no, mm -hmm. that we were going. It was still a secret. Okay. <laughs> Who then would go from New York? Well, that's the Army. They could have done it, yeah, backwards, okay. I'm sure. Now, describe a little bit the 8-inch the howitzers, the weapons your unit had. Uh, to someone who's never seen one before, how would you describe it? You mean? The 8-inch howitzer, what did it look like? Oh, that was a huge piece of machinery, and uh, when we crossed the states, that was a, quite a sight because it was all loaded on flat cars, bolted down good. Uh, the gun was hooked on the on the tractor, and mm -hmm. uh, okay. And the tractor uh, was that like a, a, a like a tank chassis kind of thing? That was a, a small small tank chassis, but it only weighed half what a tank weighed. Right. It weighed eighteen ton, and they carried the crew. And they also carried, uh, I don't remember how many rounds of ammunition as a uh, reserve. Mm -hmm. That was uh, quite a sight to be. People yeah. knew that the war was coming to an end. Yeah, well, they knew what you were carrying. Okay. Uh, now, did the train have to go slowly because it had all that equipment? I don't think so, because there was a time we went through the uh, southern part here. And that thing was going fast, I'm telling you, if you, you, you hear that clickety-click on the rails. Okay. Uh, and then they take it to New York then? Yeah, I think it was New York. Yeah, it was, because we crossed the, 
uh, bay there on a, what do you call it, ferry. Right. Went to, I think, New Jersey, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Right. Not exactly yeah. sure or something. So you had big camps around New York Harbor and then people say yeah, out of those. Oh, gee, that big that wharf was a mile long and we had carry them duffel bags that we had a ton. <laughs> now what kind of ship did they put you on? Well, that was a pretty interesting ship. It was a Saturnia. It was an a Italian luxury liner before the war. Mm -hmm. And it was converted over to a troop ship. These uh, uh, Italians, instead of be, having the Germans get them, they come over to the United States and turn themselves in. Okay. Uh, and so now the ship has been refitted, though, so yeah. it's not a luxury liner for you. Uh, it wasn't, but uh, it was still a lot. I come back on a troop ship, and there was a difference. Okay. <laughs> but there was 7,000 men on this ship, and that, that's pretty crowded. Yeah, so where on the ship did you wind up? Were you down? That was a lucky thing, too. Our commanding officer and our alpha had some pull. He had been in the Army all his life. Well, he had been in the National Guards mm -hmm. in Oklahoma, and he had some pull there, and he told somebody, I don't know who this would be, at New York. He says, we're going to be on a deck cabins, or we're not going. Now, how much authority he had and how much they believed him and paid attention to him or not, that's what we had anyway, <laughs> a deck cabins, and by luck, I had a bed, one that they didn't take out, just a regular bed and mattress. Wow. Whereas above me was two or three or four, I don't know, of those old things they bolt together yeah. in just a canvas. Right. The guy ahead of me, he made a beeline for one of those kind of things. Yeah. And he said, I, he said, I walked right past the, the bed. <laughs> I just took, it was handy. It was just there and you walked in. Okay. <laughs> All right. it. <laughs> now, uh, now, when was it that you left the U.S.? Pardon? When did you leave the U.S.? Um, when did you head to Europe? Oh, from, it was the first part of July sometime. Okay. So the D-Day invasion had already happened by then. That had Because that was in June. Uh, in fact, we didn't get to France until the, I think, two or three months after D-Day. Well, we got there September 10. Yeah. So about that. And the D-Day was months, yeah. June 6th, so right. no, it was three months, right? Okay. All right. So but you think it's July that you got on the ship, though? So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, did the ship sail by itself, or were you in a convoy? Convoy. Okay. And what was the weather like when you went across? Well, we run into a little stormy weather and some rough seas and some fog. Now, did a lot of guys get seasick? Terrible. <laughs> I enjoyed every bit of the, in fact, I got out the front of the ship and I'd just ride up in the air on the real rough days. Mm -hmm. It just felt like an elevator going so far up yep. and then come down and almost drop off from under you. But those guys down there in what they call the head, yeah. they was just hanging there wishing they could die by the looks and they mm -hmm. couldn't, but they couldn't do anything else either except just lay there and moan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because they couldn't all go on deck or anything like that. Pardon? They couldn't all go on deck at the same time or well, anything like that. Well, there would have been rooms someplace, especially if they could have made it to the tail end of the ship. They mm -hmm. wouldn't have felt so bad, because I mentioned that to a couple of them guys. I said, get back there, and they just looked at me and kind of grinned the best they could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was pitiful. All right. Now, when you were making the crossing, uh, did you have any U-boat scares or anything like that? Uh, after we was out there several days, well, the, we was out there three or four days and the boat stopped. They had to repair something and the convoy kept going and it went out of sight. That was a kind of a scare because mm -hmm. uh, they had to destroy or circling us. It kept going around us real fast. And I was glad to feel that old ship take off again and some th time throughout the night we caught up with the convoy. Mm -hmm. And then later on, a few days later, they moved all the troop ships into the center of the convoy because there were rumors that there was uh, U-boats, yep. subs, right. report, whether there was any truth okay. that, I don't know, but at any rate, yeah, you're scared. Oh, sure, I'm mm -hmm. scared, but scared to the day I got in the Army. Okay. <laughs> but specifically with the U-boats, they were out there someplace, but they didn't actually attack you. I didn't see any activity there right. of any Okay. Kind. Now, uh, when you get over to, to Great Britain, where do you land? Liverpool. In Liverpool, England, okay. And, and what do they do with you when you get off the ship? Well, we 
didn't get off very, we wasn't off very long, and they, we got on a train, a lot different than the kind we got. There was, sure looked antiquated. And uh, we rode for about a day and a half, or and overnight, I know we did that. We went down to the very southern tip, just above Plymouth. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what did you do after you got there? Uh, polished this and that and the other thing, and got everything ready because it was only there a month before we crossed mm -hmm. the channel. And were you in a camp that other American units had used already, or? They had used that before the D-Day, yeah. Okay. Now, did you uh, get to leave the camp and, and you know, go into town? Or? It wasn't much you could do. Everything was war over there yet. Uh, it was altogether different than being in the States. Mm -hmm. And uh, although I guess at the time we were there, it was a lot better than it had been. And, but uh, there wasn't much you could do. There was pubs, mm -hmm. and that's, of course I didn't yeah. go to that. Other than that, there was yeah, not much you could do, just look around. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and did you get to meet any of the English people there, or? Very few. Okay. I wasn't, uh, didn't amount to much. Okay. Uh, now, while you were in that camp, uh, did the Germans ever try to send an air raid at you or anything like I that? I've never seen it. We were only there a month, mm -hmm. but uh, the Germans were pretty well locked up over in France. Yeah. They, uh, Okay. Now, while you were there, and you're in England, you're waiting to go over, uh, were you trying to follow the news of what was happening <coughs> in, in the war at that well, point? Well, we, we was kept up on that pretty well. Yeah, we, it was, uh, our troops were in uh, Normandy, and they was going, like, towards uh, different places, St. Lo and different places mm -hmm. like that. Okay. Uh, now, when did you get the orders to, to go over to France? I don't know, but uh, we went, our, this little camp we was at, we went with all of our equipment and got on an LST. Uh, that took uh, quite a while to load because those great big guns and tractors had to go in there backwards, which was mm -hmm. just short of impossible to back with that dolly in the front of that gun. <laughs> There's only a couple guys could handle that, but they got them all in there. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, and then after that, do they only put you guys on after all the equipment is on? Well, we were pretty much all standing on there, waiting and watching. Okay. There's a lot of activity going on at, in the harbor. Right. Okay. Now, once they got the ship loaded, how long did it take to get across the channel? One day. Okay. Then we come in at, at a, real dark at night, and then the, our LST. I can remember that letting out a lot of chain just before they, with a rear anchor, just before we got to the beach. And then in the morning when uh, it started to get, well, it wasn't day, getting daylight yet, and I was leaning over the steering wheel sleeping on this weapons carrier and uh, on the top deck. And I heard a guy say that, I uh, said to a sailor, you better start waking these soldiers up because I don't know how far we're going down. Well, I was awake real wide then because I asked, I said, what, what's happening? And he says, uh, our engine room is full of water. And he says, I don't know how deep it is here, but uh, we've got to get ready to get off. Well, I put two life jackets on, or belts that they had. Mm -hmm. And then when it got a little daylight, I could see that we weren't anywhere near the beach. You could see trucks moving back and forth, silhouettes. Well, then they took bulldozers and made a causeway up to our ship, and they laid those steel mattings down like they had in the airports. Right, the PSP, you remember that. That way they could get us off there. Okay, uh, so you, well, now where were you? Was this Omaha Beach, or? Yeah. Okay. But it must have done just off to a side where they hadn't had it cleared yet from underwater obstacles because uh, that's what they claim there's three holes got punched in the bottom. Okay. Some plunder that the Germans had put there. All right. So they, they, they had missed some of them when they were clearing them off. Uh, well, either that or we was off to one side because, you know, when they're coming in the dark, uh, mm -hmm. what else? What they got? How do they, how do they ever know where the Bloomin' Beach was? Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, so now you just drive right off and then you just drive on up off the beach? And yeah. Uh, and then once you're off the beach, did they load you onto trains, or did you just drive where you were we going? We drove to a camp, and then 
we made our own camp uh, pup tents in uh, kind of woods there in uh, some place in Normandy. Okay, so somewhere not very far from the beach. So you just go well, in a day. And... Just a couple, okay. three miles up. All right. And then how long did you stay there? Well, it couldn't have been very long. If we got there on the 10th of September, the first part of October, we were in uh, combat already. So uh, we weren't there very long, okay. a couple, three weeks, I guess. Okay. Now, where did they send you? You're heading in the front line at this point extends from the Netherlands down to the Swiss border. So where did they send you? Well, we uh, come, I know we come through Belgium and Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. It was, we stayed in Luxembourg for a night or two, maybe longer than that, I can't remember that. It was a couple of days anyway. Uh, it was raining all the time, mud, for that six was unbelievable. <laughs> Everything was stuck. Mm -hmm. When they would hook, uh, get a tractor stuck there, hook it onto a tree to anchor it to a tree to pull a tree out of the ground, you know, like big apple trees and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, so were most of the roads dirt roads? A lot of them were cobblestone. Okay. Uh, I'm sure there was blacktop too. Okay. Yeah. But you wouldn't think of a, a tractor, a tractor would get stuck in the mud, but it would get it stuck in other places too? When mud was as deep as it was, and so many people ahead of us with equipment like that tearing it all up, it was okay. plain slop. All right. So yeah. even if there was pavement, in some cases, the vehicles were already chewing oh, it yeah. up. A lot of that pavement was all torn up even. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now, when you were driving across France and, and through Luxembourg, um, did, did the civilians pay any attention to you, or? Oh yeah, we we seen a lot of civilians waving and waving flags and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Okay. And hollering different things you couldn't understand their language, but. <laughs> but you hope they you were knew friendly. They were happy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, and, and so, where did you wind up then? When you're. Where do you join the, you know, front lines or oh, well, get up there? Uh, that must have been in Kirkrad Holland. Okay. Yeah, it was just on. Uh, well, the, we do, went over the fence. They had them kind of like cyclone fence, and they, we was on the German side of that. Mm -hmm. And I remember within a few days, the uh, engineers come and took that fence all down in case we get chase back, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have to try to climb over the fence or find a few openings that we had to have the fence out of the way. All right. Now, um, what larger organization uh, was your, your battalion attached to? Were you with an Army Corps or? Well, that was the 9th Army, we were, yeah. but we was in that uh, 13th Corps. Okay. So your Corps artillery, so you're not part of the division, you're part of an Army Corps, which has several divisions. Yeah. And so your guns are going to support whoever needs you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how quickly did the guns go into action? Well, I don't remember that exactly, but it seems like right as soon as we got there. Yeah. We just, yeah, well, there was a lot of shooting going on, so uh, we got right in on that, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, how much did you know about what was going on? I mean, did you have a sense of who was attacking whom, or did you just... Pretty hard to know because there was so much uh, noise. Uh, our guns going off and incoming mail, we called it. Mm -hmm. Now, how much incoming mail did you get? Not as much as we put out. Okay. Now, was this German artillery fire shooting back? Yeah. Okay. Did you ever get attacked by German aircraft? Oh, boy. Yeah, in, in uh, that and uh, our American P-51s. We took one down. Uh, so you had American planes attacking you? Well, yeah, they, uh, this time when the Americans, that was the first air attack we had. Mm -hmm. uh, I had just been to a shower in Holland on the other side of the line and took one of the first showers I took in two months since I left someplace back in France. And uh, all the ground was being ripped up around me. I could just see it. And instantly after that, the, this plane dove right in above me, uh, with the machine guns all going, and it was a heck of a noise. There was four planes in all, I think. Well, they figured they made a mistake and hit the wrong spot. So they swung around and come back, and that was the real mistake they made. 
because our guys that were on machine guns were ready then. Mm -hmm. And they had already gotten orders from someplace. If you come back, shoot them. In fact, we had orders before we went into combat. Whoever shoots at you, you shoot back. And, well, these guys come and they took that one guy down. And, boy, them old planes were shooting out smoke and they were wiggling their wings, you know, to show that they're friendly. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, of course, he got shot down and he went through a whole mess of row houses in Holland. Okay. It killed four Hollanders, plus it killed this captain who was from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, was he the pilot? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if they had figured out that you were friendly, why were they coming at you the second time? Uh, that's a mistake they made. They mm -hmm. ought to known better than that because, but you know, when you're in combat conditions, mm -hmm. there's so many things aren't functioning properly in your mind. You can, right. Uh, hindsight is a hint of a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, they thought they made a mistake and they thought they, because they shut off real quick. And uh, so they swung around and come back just to see if they had been in the wrong place. Well, uh, okay, they were in the wrong place now. Yeah, that makes at least some sense. Well, the next day, the three officers, they were all first lieutenants, they come back in a jeep because they'd been stationed in France somewhere. Mm -hmm. They come back in the jeep, they wanted to see where their buddy got killed the day before. Uh, this is something they don't get to do because generally they're on the German side, so right. they don't get to check the area out. But mm -hmm. this time they've got to check it out. But they never did say why they attacked us. It just, well, from up there, going three or four hundred miles an hour, I suppose it's hard. Although all of our equipment had iridescent sheets over the top. They ought to be able to see that. Maybe they did, but too late, huh? Yeah. Well, there was mistakes with the war. Sure. There's a lot of mistakes in there. And, of course, the junior guys would have followed the captain. So if the and captain made a doing, mistake, That's right, then, he was the leader. Yeah. I remember they said that. Okay. Uh, now, um, you also said you, you sometimes saw German aircraft? Well, uh, it wasn't long later, and uh, <coughs> the Germans, uh, was just one plane, he uh, strafed us, and uh, I went running out, it was on New Year's Day of uh, 45, 45 yeah. or in the morning, just daylight. And uh, he, we went running up to our gun, both Fred Sturgis and I, and we, I could just see all the, hear all the noise, it was terrible. Uh, I suppose he had a, all the machine guns going on his planes. And uh, all the cement, this house or building, whatever it was, on the side of the street, all the cement was being chipped off, it's like somebody pulled a big zipper. You know, all that cement was just flying. Well, then he went sailing around this way and that way and the other way, and then you know, all of a sudden the plane come to a, it looked like it almost come to a stop. It didn't really stop, I'm sure, but then it uh, kind of start coming down in a swirling motion. Just then this pilot jumped out with his knees up near his chin, you know, and the parachute opened, and of course all these guys down below was trigger happy, and, they all let go, and man, this guy didn't come down like a rag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but then his plane was coming down in a kind of a spiral motion, and I wanted to watch that hit because this isn't something you see every day. Uh, there was a lot of junk flying around, I'm sure, but I wanted to see it hit because it was going to be right in front of me, not far away. And just then, old Fred, by a machine gun, he hollered out to me, he says, I've been hit. So as I turned around to see once what happened to him, he had his pants down and his whole legs and his stomach were all poked full of holes, bloody blood. And uh, well, then that plane must have crashed right there and dang Fred called me away just when the show was at the greatest. And uh, then I helped him up to the medics because mm -hmm. he was kind of hurt. And in fact, I. He he was hurt worse than, than he lit on or whatever. And I helped him up to the medics. Well, then I went back by my machine gun, and the cover was all bent, and so was the back end was ripped out. <clears throat> well, while I was there, uh, there was water about six inches deep and mud, and the ice was thin enough it cracked when we walked on it, down in this hole. Well, then twice uh, something 
come through the air and hit. It made a good plunk. And I thought, I ain't doing it <coughs> any good here. Mm -hmm. I thought, this is a heck of a place to lay if I get hit. So I went up to the medics and uh, to see how Fred was doing. They were still patching him up because he had a, quite a few holes. All the guts in the machine gun blew out because the, the barrel had been froze full of ice. So everything came out the back of the gun and caught old Fred. Okay. <laughs> So it wasn't German fire that did it. it no. was, the plane didn't hit him. It was just the, the <clears throat> machine gun yeah. having problems. Probably. Okay. Uh, so after that, did you learn to keep the gun cleaner? Did I do what? Keep the gun more clean. Well, there was not nothing we could do about it. It was zero weather and mm -hmm. the frost got in that barrel. So there, we had a cover over the barrel and I slipped that off just before Fred pushed the trigger. Mm -hmm. And of course the first bullet went out yep. and jammed and out come the rest in the back and mm -hmm. caught him. All right. Uh, now, did you stay in that place uh, in Holland for a long time? Were you in the same place that, uh, yeah, at that I time that you first exactly came to? exactly how long we were there. We weren't there an awful long time because there was a river up there, and I think it was the Ruhr. Uh, we were, men were getting ready to cross that, but mm -hmm. we were firing across that all the time to keep it softened up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was awful muddy all the time. It rained every day out there. Okay. Now, do you remember when you went forward? Was it after New Year's that you went forward? Uh, well... Because you said you got the, the first air, air attack was right on New Year's Day. That, that was a German air attack. The first, before that, it was in November sometime. Okay, okay. Uh, now, when the, the German, that was an American plane. Okay. Now, when the German plane attacked, were you still uh, in the Netherlands then? No, this was in... Okay. We was up in the Germany. You were in Germany by then, okay. All right. Uh, now, in this period here, very beginning of '45, are you advancing slowly now and then, or we went pretty good for a while? We was we was accomplishing quite a bit, and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, the Germans were disorganized, and we really moved on. And there was big pockets of Germans being captured. There were a lot of them. Coming and I seen Germans already just throw their hands up in front of me. Just, uh, <laughs> in fact, this one farmer I drove, I was driving a truck going somewhere, and all of a sudden he dropped his hole and he threw his hands up in the air. He was scared that I was going to do something. I didn't give a dang. He was doing what he was doing. <laughs> but, right. uh, okay, well, I'm going to try to follow sort of the way, the, the sequence of the war. We kind of got up to the banks of the Rhine River by early March. The Rhine is a really big river. Yeah. Do you remember crossing that? Yeah, well, yeah, uh, the, the, the part we went, I remember, we went through on a pontoon bridge, you know, it was, had a smoke screen over it so that the uh, Germans couldn't see us. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you also mentioned before that you were providing support for the guys who landed on the other side of the river and the gliders yeah. and stuff? Yeah, now there's a town of Wessel, and that was where we come to it. Uh, okay. That was a pile of rubble, but it was smoking and burning. And uh, all those gliders were out in the field. Man, the fields were full of them. I, those guys went through an awful lot just getting town on the ground, and mm -hmm. then they had to fight the Germans yet. They had a, they had, that's why I say there's a lot of bigger stories to tell than what I got. Right, <laughs> okay. Uh, now, did you go through the town of Vessel, or did you go it was, around it? No, we went through it, but it was just enough room to drive through it and worm your way around through the rubble that was in the streets. Right, because you had these big tractors with the big guns yeah. behind you, so that was took some doing. Okay, now you mentioned encountering a lot of Germans surrendering. What did the German soldiers look like to you? Well, <laughs> some of them were pretty rugged looking. Uh, this one time, too, we went to a place uh, I might mention is uh, we were supposed to have a major was supposed to be up on the corner to tell us where to get off this road and uh, he got trapped. Uh, one of our guns couldn't make it over this little bridge that was made over a creek and there was a general there and of course, this major didn't dare to walk off on this general. He either got fired on the spot, so he stayed there. But now he wasn't up ahead to show us guys where to turn off. And I was in headquarters company, and we didn't turn off. 
There was nobody there to tell us. Now we run into the Germans. I could see all the guns flashing over there. And they were shooting at us. And we was in what you call an area called no man's land. And we got in a little village, probably not bigger than Marne. And uh, uh, we couldn't go any further because the Germans were shooting at us. So we could see the guns shooting at us. Also, we found out that some of our guns in the back of us, being towed, was being shot at and stopped. And now we were kind of trapped. And the old colonel was there, and I remember talking to him, and he was the first time I ever seen him, and he was scared. When I seen that, I also was scared. And uh, what they did to get us back out of there, that tap each one of us, and I drove a weapons carrier then, we would just stop at one end of the town and get the fly and start and go as fast as we could for that next mile or two out in the open so that the Germans couldn't pick us off as we was going through there because it is hard to hit a moving target with mm -hmm. a German 88 or whatever they had, 75s, any, anything. So we lucky we all got out there, but uh, there was a lot of guys got wounded, uh, especially in the gun battery where they lost their tractors and guns. Right. Now, was it just a headquarters company that was all the way up in the village? Yeah. And we all got out of there. Yeah. And you just had machine guns and sidearms and stuff, right? Yeah, but I uh, didn't want to start using them against oh. somebody with 88s and nope. 75. <laughs> Not what you're there for. Okay. So you have that particular close call. Now, when you were taking German prisoners, were they uh, mostly about your age or were they older or younger? When I was taking what? The German prisoners. Were they about your oh, age or? There was everything. <laughs> there was an awful lot of young kids, and there was some old men, not as old as I am, but uh, <laughs> you can see they was having a hard time hobbling. Of course, mm -hmm. how many miles had they gone already, too? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you kind of, did you have the sense at that point that the Germans were kind of about at the end of their rope? Oh, yeah, we, we could see that, yeah. All right. Yeah, uh, but they still had some spunk left. Every, every once in a while, we'd... Run into something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now, did your unit support some of the attacks uh, into the Ruhr area, or yeah. the big industrial area? And yeah. so, did you kind of stay in one place for a while and shoot or move yeah. around? Yeah, we could uh, move move real quick. Our those gun crews were experts at their mm -hmm. job. Everybody knew what they were doing, and they done it fast. And if it was twenty four hours a day of work, they did it. Mm -hmm. So they can move that equipment in a hurry. Okay. All right. Now, um, you had a, a couple of particular events that kind of stand out in your history. Now, at one point, you ran across a place where there had been a bunch of um, basically slave laborers or that the Germans had killed. Them. Can you describe that? Well, that was the town of Gardley. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, our path of destruction was quite a bit over by now. And uh, we was up by the Elbe River, and we come to this barn. It was more like a big warehouse, and uh, it must have just happened the day before the Germans burned that place. It was stink something terrible. Well, my brother was with me there, and I had a little camera I bought at the PX in California for 98 cents, and it was drizzling that day. And, and, uh, I told him, I said, that thing won't take a picture of this stuff. He said, well, do it, you're nothing out. Well, they all turned out. Mm -hmm. And I got some pictures to show it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a lot of, that, that barn had an awful lot of people in it. I'm just saying 1,500, but I'm sure there was that many. There was a hint of a slew of people piled up in all the corners. And were there any survivors around or people who escaped? No, uh, but this article here I got from our uh, company, uh, whatever you want to call it, paper, mm -hmm. tells that some did survive, I think two in all. Mm -hmm. There was more than that at first, but they got cut down. But it was funny too, they, were just, they had big ditches dug, bulldozers had dug uh, some trenches there to bury them in mass mm -hmm. burials. And uh, I didn't see this happen, but I just seen it after it happened. This, they, somebody got a hold of a German officer and they were marching them around just to look at this thing. Just then this German officer, these guys were all carrying Thompson subs and everything else. This German was going to jump across this ditch with a big trench. Well, 
he and Mel Moore made his first jump, and that was his last too because everybody opened up on him, and he laid down the bottom of that trench there. Mm -hmm. Then a couple other guys come along, and they wanted to get a picture of him. So this other guy says, just a minute, he says, um, wait till I do something I was going to shoot. He said, I'll give you a good picture, and he emptied a, a clip of ammunition from his Thompson sub on this guy German's head. It just swelled out. It's about as big as a wash tub. It just mm -hmm. opened it up. A pitiful looking thing. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that was all part of it, you know? Yeah. All right. Uh, now, at this point in time, you're advancing across Germany late in the war. Uh, did the German civilians mostly just get out of your way, or? They pretty much left, yeah. Yeah, once in a while you'd see some of your own, but they were pretty scared of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, what happened? Right. The, now, did you actually see any of the Russians? Because you get up to the Elbe River. Did you see them? Yeah, I uh, don't remember where I was. I know we crossed the Elbe River on a pontoon bridge, and uh, after we got there, we didn't see any Russians, but we only went in and landed a little ways, a couple miles, mm -hmm. I'm saying. And uh, then we understood that we don't belong there. We this was going to be Russian real estate as soon as the shooting stops. So we were ordered back to the west side of the Alp, and then we crossed that same bridge again. I think it was a little town of Barbie, but it was south of Magdeburg. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember where I first met Russians, but I did uh, talk to them the best I could and motion with our hands and whatnot. And, and what did those guys look like? Well, they were rugged people too. They weren't dressed as good as we were and they weren't fed as good as we were, I'm sure of that. <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't think there was much stopping them. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, you had an unusual thing happen to you right at the very time of the German surrender. Uh, can you describe that story? Well, the 7th of May, it was a quiet morning. We, now we knew that this stuff was over with pretty well the night before already. And then that, that mor morning of uh, May 7, a guy named George Hambidge and I, we walked on a road and we come to this arsenal, a German arsenal there, and there was the jeep sitting there. And there was nobody around until we got up by it Then I found this one guy was slumped over in the seat. He'd been shot, and there's two laying alongside the jeep. So we just, like dummies, walked over there and looked it over a little bit more. We shouldn't have because we knew better than to do something this stupid, but we didn't know it at the moment. And, uh, well, yeah, if the snipers were still around, well, we were next in line. But anyway, then another jeep rolled up, and. Uh, uh, American soldier was uh, driving it, and he had two Germans with him. And uh, then he come to a quick stop, because I think he was half crocked. He was celebrating the war a little bit already. And he looked at that other Jeep sitting there, and it had uh, written on the bumper, it was an airborne off it. I think it was a 101st Airborne mm -hmm. he was from. And he seen that, so he got out of the Jeep out of his ship and went and went over there to look at these dead guys. And uh, just then this German in the front seat started yakking something to me and of course I couldn't understand so I went over by him and uh, then he said it again, whatever it was, I don't know, but the guy, well he was speaking German yet, see. Well then this guy in the uh, back seat, he introduced himself as being lieutenant something or other, and he was the interpreter for this general. Mm -hmm. Well, he said this general so-and-so wanted to be taken to my commanding officer. Well, I told him, I said, I just happened to be walking past here, and I said, I have nothing to do with this. So I, I called the, this other guy, the, I, let's call him Joe, mm -hmm. and I called him over there, and I says, uh, come on over here. I says, these crowds want to talk to you. So he come wandering towards us, and he was just a cussing and a swearing and raising all kinds of hob. And he claimed that he knew all these guys that were dead. Mm -hmm. And they had come up all the way through Italy and jumped into Normandy. 
before daylight mm -hmm. on D-Day. And he says, now they come all the way up here to get killed on the last day. And then he was wearing some more. So uh, just then this old lieutenant in the back, he says, General so-and-so wants to be taken to your commanding officer at once. He made it sound tough, you know. <laughs> well, this old uh, driver, he was, like I say, half lit up. Mm -hmm. He grabbed this general by, the, by his lapel. He, I seen him stick his thumb under it, his fingers over it. He shook him back and forth like that. He said, what, are you a goddamn general? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now these guys were scared, and you could see it. They showed it. But after all, they'd just come through the no man's land, mm -hmm. leaving their, the protection of their army behind, only to come face to face with the enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, half of them were trigger happy, and, and some of them were uh, half pickled like Joe. <laughs> mm -hmm. They had reason to be scared. Especially when uh, us guys were standing down there with guns on our shoulders, you know. And, uh, well, anyway, well, this guy jumped in his jeep and away they went. Mm -hmm. now, but, uh, well, the rest of that day was, uh, people were going here, there, and other places on foot. Or, or everybody, civilians, mainly, yeah. Mm -hmm. There were soldiers too, but uh, mainly civilians. They were running here and there all over the place. And, uh, and then and the next day, you want me to go on? Yeah. Uh, the next morning, which was the 8th, the war was officially over. And I was standing at the Autobahn, it was right there by us, and uh, these people were going by the thousands now. There yeah, must be, uh, nobody slept that night. Everybody was civilians, mm -hmm. refugees or whatever you want to call them. And they were going both directions down the Autobahn. No traffic of any kind of car. There must be there was some holes in the road somewhere. Okay. And uh, this one girl, uh, kind of a teenager, I would say, she come towards me from my left, and she almost looked like she was glad to see me. And uh, she asked me in plain English, just perfect. She says, uh, where in America are you from? Well, I told her I was from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And she says, I used to live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I said, well, what in the heck are you doing in this crazy place at this time? Well, she said her dad was from Germany, and when Germany first got to win in the war, the, he thought he'd better come over here and help. Now, whether he did that on his own or Hitler says, get over here or we'll come and get you, he probably belonged to the German army, who knows. Mm -hmm. At any, any rate, she was 12 years old, and she went with her dad over to Germany, and then they got stuck there because, uh, and she left her eight-year-old brother and her ma over in Milwaukee. But now, I was kind of screwed up being in combat seven months. I wasn't thinking too straight. I shoot her off because, uh, and then I went back to my outfit. But later on, I got to thinking, I, you know, I should have uh, talked to her more yet because I'm sure she'd had some interesting tales about mm -hmm. the last five, six years that she was there. But uh, that's the way it goes. You yeah. Know. Think of it all later, you know? Now, when you were seeing all these people walking back and forth, uh, did you think that any of them were trying to get away from the Russians, or were they just going home, or you do not know? I suppose some of them were going back to Russia, or, or Russian territory, yeah. and some were getting away from it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know uh, it was, wasn't long after the war ended. Uh, I took a there was a convoy of trucks, I don't remember how many, probably 30 of them. It was taking a bunch of refugees back to the Russian territory mm -hmm. up near Berlin. And uh, I was driving the last truck or the one next, the uh, last truck I think it was, uh, it was a, one of six bikes. And there was, uh, we, I think there was about 24 women on there. And uh, the rest was all Every kind of person. I don't think there was any soldiers, though. Mm. It was all just refugees. And uh, we went to a town of Ludwigslust. That's not too far from Berlin. And uh, in Hamburg, up in that area. And we dropped them off, because they was going up into the Russian territory. So uh, 
It was going every direction. Mm -hmm. and it, but everybody was hungry because there was uh, no, uh, there was no hamburgers, no, there was no yeah. McDonald's to go to. Yeah, I mean, did your men in your unit, did you, did you give anybody any food or anything? I wish to that this day that I would give that one girl uh, some C or K rashes because I'm sure I could have scrounged some up somewhere around mm -hmm. there. And, uh, but I never thought of it at the time. No, I didn't give anybody any food. Okay, well this tape is about up, so we're going to pause here. Okay, now we had taken your main story kind of down to the time of the German surrender, but I gather there was at least one more uh, incident you want to bring into it. There's something about uh, wanting to throw a grenade into a foxhole. Oh, you... yeah, okay. There was a number of things the guy could talk about all day long and all night, but I'll mention this one in a way. Uh, sometimes when we, as we moved up, we'd use a foxhole that was already there. And uh, this one time, it was kind of early in the morning, I thought, I ought to move my machine gun and stuff over to that hole, it's that big looking one from here. And I was just about ready to toss a hand grenade in there in case there was a, somebody in there I didn't want to see. But I thought, no, I better just peek over the edge and see once what's in there. Gee, there were three infantrymen they had been fighting all night somewhere and they would get some sleep. Holy cats, I think of that every day now. I could have killed them guys like nothing. But then I looked off to one side and here stands a guy by the foxhole and there were two dead Germans there laying right by it. And I had seen this area the night before and there was no Germans there then. So I said to him, I says, where the hell did those crowds come from? Well, they weren't there yesterday. He says, no, he says, I just shot them last night. He says, uh, they was in that foxhole and I needed it and they wouldn't come out. So I just shot them and pulled them out. <laughs> that's the that's the way life was, I guess. Okay. So was it kind of common to find holes or trenches to take over? It was uh, in some places, yeah. If we moved uh, slow, if we moved fast, of course, well, then we moved out of the area where there was holes. Right. But uh, generally, there was plenty of there was plenty of holes around. You didn't have to dig. I I dug a number of machine gun pits and foxholes myself. In fact, one, I've got to mention that too, it was an old town. Uh, I didn't realize how old it must have been, but it had been maybe a thousand years because I, this lieutenant told me to show, show me a good place to put a machine gun pit right on the curve of this little road. It was in the back part of the town. The front part had a newer road, but on the back part of the town there, it had an old trail. And I, no matter how deep I dug, I kept running into stones and cinders and rock and every other thing. Well, then I, I thought, how in the heck deep can this material be? Well, then finally I run into soft earth. But then I got to realize, heck, this town's a thousand years old. That, that trail's probably been there a thousand years, you know, being built up slowly on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I used have I use a pickaxe and all, because I only went down about three, four feet in the, at the most. Yeah, but I, I knew I went down three feet before I struck any decent soil. Mm -hmm. now, would the Germans sometimes leave booby traps behind them? Would they leave what? Booby traps, would they? Oh, yeah, that's a bad thing, too. They, they would, uh, we always had on our vehicles a uh, iron, piece of angle iron up the front bumper with a hook on the top so that uh, they would, if they strung a piano wire across the uh, road, it would hook that and okay. it would stop it. Uh, but yeah, they would leave booby traps. Uh, okay. uh, they would, uh, the engineers generally took care of a lot of that before we got there. They would take mine detectors and stuff and mm -hmm. uh, there was men that was trained for looking at but I suppose a lot of them missed some some of them. Okay. Now, you were, during a time the war is still going on, you're basically out in the field over the winter of 44, 45. You'd have a fair amount of cold weather, snow, rain, yeah. that kind of thing. Now, did you spend most of your time outside, or could you sleep indoors, or what did you do? Uh, that, uh, you never had a place to go, but you'd seek out something. This could be day or night, whenever you could find a few minutes to take a nap quick. Yeah, that wars were mostly fought at night. I, uh, everything was done at night, it seemed like. <laughs> and we'd have uh, sometimes artificial moonlight. They had a great big huge thing on a trailer, a big light, and they'd shine that up and it'd reflect down. And then 
What was real scary at times was that you use a flare. Now that could be fired up either with a German or American. It was uh, not necessarily red, kind of a crimson, and uh, real spooky. Uh, <laughs> and you also mentioned uh, you, you would have to sleep with your clothes on? Oh, boy. I had to sleep sometime in that seven months. I never had my clothes off in seven months. Helmet and boots, that's all, that's all, all of it. You, know, you better not get caught without it. You might. How are you going to get time to put anything on? Well, you had to keep it on to stay halfway warm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, yeah, because if you're sleeping outside, did you have well, to sleep outside a lot? Most of the time was some kind of a thing inside. Okay. I know one time I got to a place and I got in the basement. for It was nice down there, like a Hilton Hotel. There was a pile of coal down there, and, which I slept on. And uh, there, was, there was two guys down there on, uh, operating a telephone, uh, something to do with fire direction with their guns and headquarters. And uh, that night, uh, Dormer got blow, blown off the house. Now, I never heard it because I was so sound asleep. It was mm -hmm. one of my beautiful nights, uh, a, a night off, you might call it, yeah. Okay. Uh, now, you mentioned there was the one time when you got ahead of the units and got into no man's land and got shot at. And Was that the closest you got to an actual regular combat situation? Well, no. Uh, I had another time when this, this must have happened just a couple of days or maybe a, yeah, a few days before the war ended. We was uh, up near the Elbe and uh, we had, there was eight guys come prisoner, POWs, they come to our outfit. Uh, five of them was Australians and two of them, three of them were New Zealanders and they got across the line somehow and uh, to our outfit. So the first thing to do is to take them to get them off the front. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guy that drove this truck was busy with something else and asked me if I would take that truck. And so uh, I drove him, drove that down along with his assistant driver. And uh, it took longer than usual because there was so much traffic. There was all kinds of noise and heavy military traffic there. And when we got to this place, we had to drop them off at a, it wasn't much of an airfield, but it was a, a grass and mm -hmm. weeds, a, a plane could land and take off on. We dropped those guys off and turned around and went back for home. And I'll be dying, we couldn't go because the Germans had just broke through behind us. So we went back to where they were, where we dropped them off, and we decided to stay there for the night. Uh, we didn't have any food, so we looked for some. We couldn't find it, but we did find some water. And we told those New Zealanders and Australians what had happened, and they were mighty nervous because they had been prisoners for five years already, and they didn't want to get caught again. Mm -hmm. But the next morning, uh, I slept with one eye open all night in the back of the truck because uh, we didn't have any guards around us there either. And the next morning, just before daylight, well, or just about daylight, we took off, and that uh, where the Germans had broke through, there was uh, the, the ta our tank destroyers come and destroyed them. Mm -hmm. There was seven uh, vehicles burning yet. Uh, it was American and German burning. Mm -hmm. So they must have just opened that road up. Uh, so we was on the wrong side of the something there. <laughs> now you have some pictures of knocked out or abandoned German tanks. And was that from this incident or from no, some other time? No, these, these, these were from long before. Okay other office. All right. Uh, now, you get to the end of the war, Germans officially surrender. Were there still Germans out making trouble after the 8th of May? Or? I heard that there was some pockets here, there, and other places, but uh, I never seen it. Okay. Now, um, did your unit stay in that part of Germany, or did you move somewhere else? Well, no, we was... Uh, we wasn't far, 57 miles from Berlin at one time, mm -hmm. I know that, but then we took off and went to a little town of Tann that's not far from Frankfurt and Fulda, mm -hmm. gives you a rough idea where it yeah. is. And uh, that little town of Tann, it was a really interesting town, it was probably a real old town, un unbelievably. 
and uh, we stayed there for a while. Then I don't know. I went from there somewhere. Well, how long did you stay in Germany? From the time I first got there. Well, I mean, after the end of the war, how well, long did you stay? Well, I, I bet, and it must have been pretty close to six, seven months because the, from the time the war ended till the time I got discharged was eight months. Mm -hmm. Well, part of that was on the ocean, and part of it was in uh, Belgium and Antwerp before we got on the ship. Right. Okay. Now, while you were there in Germany and you were in this town at, at Tann and so uh, what did you do? Well. <laughs> anything we could do to, for entertainment, huh? No, we didn't, we didn't have anything really to do. Okay, so you didn't have any particular responsibilities, you weren't guarding anything, you were just, That's just there. It, yeah. Okay. Uh, and did you kind of just set up a regular quarters and find places to stay? Oh, yeah, we had, uh, I, I was in one room for a while, it was called Hotel Munsell. It was a wooden building. You could tell it was older than Sam Hill. Remember, we yeah, went there we that time there. Right afterwards, and then uh, we was in. Uh, we had uh, another room. I was in with this one guy. I remember there was a hand of a long stairs coming up there. And, uh, must, must be why I was having allergy in those days, because I was just towards the last of the steps up to the top. I was going real slow, and he, I heard him holler one time. And it, he said, "You think you're going to make it?" I said, "I don't know." <laughs> But no, we we had uh, good, there were things to do, just really more or less just kind of waiting out time for our number to be called to be shipped home. Right, uh, and then uh, did you have much contact with the German civilians then? We weren't allowed to speak to them. Mm -hmm. However, we did uh, sneak around. In fact, I even had a girlfriend there for a while. There you go. And uh, that helped to break up the day. And. Uh, but it wasn't long afterwards, all the big warriors from D.C. come over there with their nice new uniforms and candy and cigarettes, and they opened up this uh, no fraternizing deal. They, it was rare to go. They had her made now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So things loosened up over the course of oh, the yeah. time that you were there. All right. Uh, now, within your own unit, did men start to go home one by one or in small groups or all at once? We didn't. No, it wasn't anybody going home right away yet. Hey, it was a big deal because the, the, the war had ended and that, it was, I don't know how many million people were over there all wanting to go home. Mm -hmm. It was a big job. Nobody planned on that yet. So it, was, it took a little time to get this thing okay. organized. Now initially, did anyone talk about having to go and invade Japan or was that not your problem? Oh yeah, there was some outfit packaging up and getting out of there already. Engineers were doing that. Mm -hmm. I suppose the infantry too, I don't know that. But, okay. but your so unit wasn't doing that. Our, uh, with building heavy artillery, we weren't first on the list for that. Right. That was right. a good thing because I uh, would just soon miss out on that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We missed out on the other invasion and I didn't, I wasn't looking forward to any, any kind. Cause right. That, that was, uh, we went through the areas where, like through uh, Normandy mm -hmm. and that. And uh, believe me, that couldn't have been a picnic. No. It was unbelievable. Okay. Now, while you were there, uh, well, actually, while you were during the war and then after it, uh, how much contact did you have with people back home? Did you write back and forth, or did your brother keep track? Well, back home? Yeah. Yeah, we kept writing. In fact, uh, several times people that I talked to, civilians, uh, give me a letter to write to various family and friends over here in the United States. Mm -hmm. and then, I just put a little note in with it saying I, because they weren't able to write to each other yet, I guess, and they had lost contact with the, their family and friends and stuff for a long time. So were these, uh, I mean, German people doing asking you to do this, or just yeah. others? Okay. Yeah. All right. I, I talked to quite a few German people. I don't think uh, most of the German people himself was in favor of the war. Probably uh, not. Maybe they were at the time when they were doing all the winning. I don't know about that, but... Uh, as soon as they were losing, of course, then they jumped on the, the side, the winning side, mm -hmm. I suppose. I don't know how that went. Yeah. Now, did you ever meet any people who really were still kind of Nazis or really didn't like you? I 
can't say. I, one guy I know, uh, he, he was in the Battle of the Bulge there, and he, he said if we could have got more gas, he was a soldier, mm -hmm. he said if we could have got petrol, he said we, we could have won. Well, that mm -hmm. might have been, because uh, at one time there was an awful big I mean, a pile of gasoline dump of ours, mm -hmm. getting ready for the big push. And uh, seeing that bulge got around that, got that, uh, one of our last guys set that on fire and burned that up. Oh, we got sort of millions of gallons of gas went up with smoke. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, uh, there was there was some people that uh, was still thinking they could win at the end, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now during the time that you were there in in Germany, did you see signs of things beginning to get put back together and life go back to normal? Not or the was time, it? not while I was there. Okay. It was pretty well destroyed forever. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and then, so so when did you actually get your orders to go home? Was that November maybe, or? Yeah, it was late October or November, something okay. like that, because, uh, yeah, maybe even December, because uh, I was in Antwerp and I got on the ship at Antwerp to head home, and I, I was only out in the ocean a couple of days, and it was New Year's. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. yeah, so December, yeah. All right, and now you said you, you went home on a troop ship. What was that like? Well, that wasn't bad. It was called the Rensselaer. It was a, called a Liberty or a Victory ship. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was made purposely for tr carrying troops. It was a, a good ship, but nothing like a luxury liner. Right. Now, was the weather okay when you went back? We didn't have it bad, although I understand that some, my cousin come on the ship behind us, not very many days, and he hit some awful rough seas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how long did it take to get back? I think it was 10, 12 days, okay. 13 something in that area. Yeah. But now we wasn't on the convoy, mm -hmm. just the way we went. And you weren't zigzagging back and forth, you were just no. going straight. That's yeah. right. Okay, and where did you land in the U.S.? Well, Newport News, how does that sound? Virginia, yeah. yeah. A lot of guys came in there. Uh, and then, um, did you stay there very long or did you go no, home? They they run us through there in a hurry. Every, that, there again, they was uh, processing us 24 hours a day. And any time of the day or night, they could wake you up and do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, then go on to the next thing, whatever. And then we went to Camp Atterbury, Indiana. And right. That was a 24-hour day deal. Everybody was working day and night there. And I know I got uh, released along about midnight and got over to Indianapolis and took a train home from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Camp Atterbury was a big discharge center, yeah. and so you get processed there to go home to Michigan. Yeah. Okay, uh, and then what did you do after you got back home? <laughs> oh, I was busy all the time. First I had to put my car back together, my brother ruined for me, <laughs> and uh, then uh, uh, the guy, the, the day the war ended, that was a funny thing. The guy that I had worked for and never cared to work for him, he had called my mom and he wanted me to come and go to work for him. But I didn't have any idea of going to work. But when I got home, I, they had what they call 5220. So I went down there to get that. And they made that so rough for me to get it. I finally walked out just before this one mean looking old guy went to call me. And uh, I went to work for this guy I used to work for. I didn't want to, but mm -hmm. he begged me to work for him. And so reluctantly I did go to work for him. And was that as a mechanic or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and I then, wanted that 5220, but yes. holy cow, uh, they wasn't hand that thing out so easy. Okay. And can you explain what that was? Well, most uh, people won't 52 know. weeks, $20 a week, and mm -hmm. that was a million dollars after kind of money I had been making. <laughs> okay. While you were in the service, had you saved any of your pay or? I had about 1200 bucks saved up. You couldn't spend it over there. Yeah. And I, uh, when I was in the States, it pretty much all went mm -hmm. because you bought certain things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Now to look back at the time that you spent in the Army, um, how do you think that affected you or what did you learn from it? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, at the time, right afterwards, I, I figured nothing can get me down, but I've been down ever since. <laughs> <laughs> but
But no, uh, it was funny too, you know, when they when they went to get out, they had an officer give us speeches and that, and how they'd brag about everything being so good. Nothing was good about the whole works. But uh, two of them, he emphasized that uh, it was so nice that so many of us could use our military experience in civilian life. Mm -hmm. Who the hell wants a machine gunner? I haven't found anybody hiring yet. <laughs> All right. Well, you've got some very good stories, so I'd just like to thank you for taking the time to share them today.